My name is George. I'm unemployed and I live with my parents. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm sorry. I thought this was the baby's room. I'm really sorry. <laughs> threw away a lifetime of guilt-free sex and floor seats for every sporting event in Madison Square Garden. So please, a little respect, for I am Costanza, Lord of the Idiots. The Seinfeld Project began in this office in, uh, in 1988, in November of 1988, we had the very first meeting. They said that we're interested in doing a series with you. If you come up with a format, you know, we'd love to hear it. And we just came up with the idea of what if we had two comedians that would just talk all day long and we'd follow them as they went to like Bloomingdale's and went shopping and uh, they went to, on their errands and picked up their dry cleaning and, and that that would be the show. Then I think the George character came on because George slash me in a way um, because we needed we needed that other comic voice and I go that's it that's the show we'll have two we'll have two guys two comedians and we'll just follow them as they go through their uh, meaningless days and then we'll see that at night I'll be performing some of the material and that was where we ran into the first problem, which was, well, if there's two comedians, then you're going to have to see two acts. And we didn't want to do that, since it was my show. And I certainly, that was out of the question. <laughs> I had a friend in New York who was in real estate who uh, I often talked to on that level, although not quite the level that I talked to Jerry with. But, um, well, let's, let's have this guy be in, in real estate. How's the real estate business? It's uh, not bad. It's coming along. <laughs> Why? Did you need something? Did you handle any of that commercial woo, real estate? <laughs> well, I might be getting into that. You keep me posted. I'm aware of you. All right, let's go. He's like the kind of guy that you hang around with in New York who's not in the business but he's you've been your friend for a long time and you're just kind of um, in the in the important ways you're too similar to ever not be friends you know the friendship survives even though your lives are in completely different places the friendship survives because in the important ways of shallowness and uh, neurotic uh, exploration of meaningless detail that's where you bonded what's the difference between these two you got propyl paraben? Got it. You got isobutane 30? I got isobutane 20. Uh-huh. <laughs> you got uh, sorbitan sesquioleate? Got it. I have aloe. You got aloe? I love aloe. Where do they make yours? Jersey. White Plains. <laughs> the note that I got from Castle Rock on the pilot was that um, the two guys, Jerry and his friend George, were, were, were too similar. They, they were... Uh, they kind of sounded alike, and, and um, characters on sitcoms are always different, and, and, and they have conflicts. And uh, I said to them, well, why would I be friends with somebody who I didn't like? So I, I think I won that battle. The discussion as to who would play George Costanza uh, went something like this. Jerry, although extremely talented, not a strong actor. Therefore, we need a strong, like, stage actor, strong presence from the acting community that can really be two solid feet on the stage that will certainly help Jerry and can deliver the comedic punch. Mark Hirschfeld was in New York setting up uh, casting there. He was recommended. We read a lot of, a, a lot of uh, George Costanza's, a lot of more friends of Jerry's that were stand-up comedians. We considered Anthony Edwards from ER, Nathan Lane, and even Brad Hall, who is Julie Louis-Dreyfus's uh, actual husband. 
nobody ever really hit it the way we thought that it needed. And then we had Jason Alexander go on tape in New York, and, uh, and I, as I remember reluctantly. I got uh, these four pages handed to me, and they said, you're going to go read for it, uh, be put on tape, which, which we kind of know when you're a New York actor. It's uh, usually an act of, uh, uh, of comp it's a waste of time. And then we went into the screening room, and uh, they put the tape on, and there was this, this guy, and uh, he was balding, and he was a little overweight, and he, he had on a pair of glasses. I didn't actually wear glasses at the time. I uh, got a pair of glasses, and I, you know, I did on the audition tape, but, you know, a blatant Woody Allen impression. <laughs> you know, I'm going, it signals, Jerry, it signals. And I said, well, that was a complete waste of time. But the second we saw him, like two lines out of his mouth, he went, that's the guy. I mean, it was just so completely obvious that he was, he, he was so talented and so funny and perfect, just perfect. Did she even ask you what you were doing tomorrow night if you were busy? No. She calls you today, she doesn't make a plan for tomorrow? What is that? It's Saturday night. Yeah. What is that? It's ridiculous. You don't even know what hotel she's staying at. You can't call her. That's a signal, Jerry. That's a signal. Signal. <laughs> I flew out. I think I came uh, to Castle, the Castle Rock offices. Met Jerry, met Larry. Uh, God knows who else was in the room. I had no idea who Jason Alexander was. I had never, I don't even think I had heard of him. I never met Jason Alexander. I'd seen him in a Neil Simon play. But I had seen him on Broadway in a show called Jerome Robbins Broadway, for which he won a Tony Award. He accepted his award, and he was standing next to Tommy Toon. And Jason's five foot, I don't know, five? Is that right, Jason? I, I don't know how, but maybe he's five foot seven. Maybe he's five foot six. Split the difference. And Tommy Toon is whatever, you know, eight foot ten. And so the two of them like that. And I remember thinking that guy was quick on his feet because Jason played the moment brilliantly. He milked it. In 84, I was part of a, a, another uh, show called ER uh, that was a half-hour sitcom starring Elliot Gould and Mary McDonald and George Clooney. I could have been tied to anyone. <laughs> Could have been a fun evening. Did you know that the top of your head looks just like a, a bird's, bird's nest? nest. Yeah. I had done uh, a show that I was ostensibly the star of in 1987 uh, called Everything's Relative that went right out the window. Of all the new test products that you have ever brought home from the office, this new toothpaste is the worst. <laughs> it's not toothpaste. <laughs> it's, uh... Shaving paste. <laughs> kind of a new concept. When we did test the actors for the part, it became uh, between Jason and Jerry's very close friend, Larry Miller, uh, who at the time, I think, was sort of the front runner because of not only his relationship with Jerry, but that, that instant chemistry that they had. I don't know why I knew this, but I knew that Larry and Jerry were very good friends. And I said, well, this is... This is a fake complete. I mean, I, I must be here just to keep him from negotiating too hard. I mean, you know, there's, I'm, I'm the spoiler that's going to keep him in line. Larry Miller is a terrific comedian. He's a wonderful person. He read. It was fine. But subsequent to Larry reading, in came Jason Alexander. So I had nothing on it when I went into the room. I was very relaxed because uh, I knew I'm not getting this. Jerry's best friend is going to get this. And... Um, played it in the room, there, everybody laughed. He did such a wonderful job with Jerry. And Jerry, who was the first to admit he's not an actor, Jerry actually sort of rose to the occasion and actually gave more of a performance himself. They said, great, thanks. Larry shook my hand, Jerry shook my hand, whoever else was there shook my hand. I got directly into a car, went right back to the airport. And uh, I think by the time I landed back in New York, there was a call waiting that said, uh, they want to hire you. This is incredible. This is one of the greatest things I've ever done in my life. I'm going to call my mother. What for? Well, I'm in a limo. Hello, Ma. It's me. Guess where I am? In the back of a limo. Now nobody died. It, it's a long story. I can't tell you now. Because I can't. I said I can't. If I could, I would. Would you stop it? Uh, no, I, I'm, I'm getting off. No, I'm not telling you. How's this? I'm never telling you. I don't care. No, fine. Never. She 
that before you? <laughs> Listen to this. Marcy comes over and she tells me that her ex-boyfriend was over late last night and yada, 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 I'm really tired today. What do you think she was tired from? Well, obviously the yada, yada. Whoa, whoa! What is going on out there? I need like a bucket of water. I got a car overheating. I got an alarm that won't go off. I'm pressing one, I'm pressing two, nothing. What do I do? Help me, help me! <laughs> there's anything wrong with that. No, of course not. I mean, it's fine if that's who you are. Absolutely. I mean, I have many gay friends. My father's gay. Look, I... I, I know what I heard. I heard. It was a joke. All right, look, you want to have sex right now? Do you want to have sex with me right now? Let's go. Come on, let's go, baby. Come on. I think I smell some smoke back here. When you think of George Costanza, you think of this despicable human being. It's just, how can anybody be friends with this guy? But as portrayed by Jason Alexander, when you watch Jason play this character, there's just this, this little twinkle in his eye that you can't help but love. He was so different than any other character. The idea that you could have such a negative character on a sitcom and he didn't have to be heroic or helpful or um, uh, or otherwise have any uh, positive attributes I thought was wonderful it would be very easy for that character to be hateful to be boy he's just jealous or boy he's so self-centered who cares and he walked that fine tightrope of making himself endearing a merging took place in some odd way where Jason's sensitivity became an underpinning of George's insensitivity. And what you got was um, a sweet little guy doing not sweet little things. I think Jason's character was one of the most difficult to play on the show because he wasn't an extreme character. He was the middle of the road character. And those are always the toughest because uh, other characters like like Kramer's, you can always go out there. You can you can invent an over-the-top quality that becomes. But Jason had to stay within the boundaries of mediocrity. He was eternally self-justifying that he was always going to swing from the middle rung and the ladder of life. I remembered thinking how how wonderful Jason Alexander was at being inept. I mean, it's just great to turn up the screws on him because. I mean, I know he does a lot of different things really, really well, but I just love watching him fail. Jason Alexander was a magnificent actor. I mean, the things that he did used to get me upset because he was so good at laying out those things and becoming that, that uh, well, he's a pathological liar, wasn't he? I loved doing scenes with Jason, and we didn't really get a lot of scenes, just the two of us, but I love working with that guy. Treating you to lunch anymore? <laughs> what? <laughs> Jason has almost a photographic memory. He can learn lines so fast, it would throw me. He's really funny. Uh, he's got great comic range, and he's the perfect extension of Larry David's voice. I didn't realize that, that George was Larry. Probably, it was in that, you know, that first season of, with that confidence order of four. Um, it was somewhere in there, there was some, I can't remember exactly what it was. There was some, a moment in the script that, you know, with my fine classical actor training, I went to Larry and I said, Larry, First of all, this would never happen to anybody, but if it did, no human being would react like this. And Larry said, what do you mean? This happened to me, and this is exactly what I did. And I went, oh, <laughs> okay. People have uh, often asked me, 
uh, how come you didn't play George? Didn't you want to play George? And the answer to that is, is no. And plus, they never would have approved of me as an actor anyway. And how could I write it and act at the same time? And, and I, had no, I really had no interest in it at all. <clears throat> it never even occurred to me. Uh, people think that I, I, I must have been there going, oh, gee, I should be doing this. I, sh I didn't care. It never occurred to me. So I, I made a conscious switch to leave the Woody Allen model behind and start to try and do as blatant a Larry David imitation as I could. And the more I understood that, the more he seemed to enjoy the character and, and you know, the, the, the more stuff seemed to generate in scripts. The combination of Larry's life events portrayed by Jason Alexander was just, you know, a, a perfect TV character. Well, I heard a noise. <laughs> what noise? You know, a uh, blast. <laughs> what blast? From the bathroom. Oh, you think she was uh, refunding? <laughs> Every time we go out to eat, the minute we're done eating, she's running for the bathroom. So you're concerned? Elaine, of course I'm concerned. I'm paying for those meals. <laughs> if you want to just keep doing the same old thing, then maybe this idea is not for you. I, for one, am not going to compromise my artistic integrity. And I'll tell you something else. This is the show, and we're not going to change it, right? <laughs> Larry David, uh, at the time, NBC expressed interest, uh, was doing stand-up comedy, uh, and Jerry was doing stand-up comedy. I started doing stand-up in New York in the uh, late 70s. I came out to California in 1979 to do a television show called Fridays, which was sort of like a Saturday night clone show. And I remembered very specifically uh, the character he played, where he played the, the chauffeur, butler, whatever, of Howdy Doody. Good morning, Mr. Doody. How are you, Mr. Doody? You look terrific, Mr. Doody. What's wrong, Mr. Doody? And he would go, this way, Mr. Doody. Right this way, Mr. Doody. May I take your coat, Mr. Doody? And I just thought it was, it was very funny. That's the one memory I had of Larry David. And then from 1982 to 1984, I was doing stand-up in California. I got tired of it. And then no sooner was I back in New York than I got hired as a writer on Saturday Night Live. And Larry David had, as I understand it, a, a rather uh, fractious relationship with uh, the executive producer of the show. And Larry was very frustrated because he rarely got his sketches on Saturday Night Live. I wrote there for one season. I got one sketch on the air, uh, which was on at uh, 5 to 1 in the morning. It was not mainstream writing. It was very off. And um, I, I wonder if he would say that. I, I don't know. But it was, a, a, it, was not, it was not a typical SNL sketch in any way. And then I continued to do a stand-up after Saturday Night Live. It was very exciting to watch him, not only because he was a great stand-up and all the comics loved his material, but you never knew what was going to happen in the audience. Ladies and gentlemen, comedy stylings of Larry David. He was about three minutes up there. He wasn't really getting too many laughs, and he goes, I don't need this. Forget it. So he threw the microphone down, called the audience a bunch of ignorant and and walked <laughs> off the stage. He said, you. He said, you people. And he left the stage. I went, wow, what an act. <laughs> Me and my friends go, what the hell was that? And, and three years later, I was playing them. You know, it was, it's all kismet. <laughs> You know, they made the movie A Beautiful Mind. If they was going to make a movie about Larry, it would be called The Desperate Mind. In, in his mind, there's a great desperation and a, a, a great sensitivity to perceived slights or misperceived. Larry was a struggling comic. Um, not exactly showrunner material and not exactly somebody that gave us a lot of confidence. I really had no experience writing sitcoms. I'd never been on one. I'd, I'd never written on one. I had, I had nothing to do with them. I know that uh, most studios will say, you know, get a very established writer, but I like the idea that these two felt so excited and so compatible. I thought when I heard that they were going to pair up that it was a good combination because they kind of uh, always mixed to me um, two separate elements that come together really well. Larry goes to very dark places and and arguably the show was really about very dark people um jerry has a lightness to him 
Jerry is a great writer, and when the two of them would get together, it was, it was like John Lennon and Paul McCartney. I mean, these guys could write a TV show. It just came through. Well, it's over. It's definitely over. She broke up with you. No, but I can tell she's going to. I can sense it. We had this terrible phone conversation. I was so nervous before I called, I made up this whole list of things to talk about. Who's on the list? Uh, let's see. <laughs> Oh, I'm very good at going in reverse in my car. <laughs> Why isn't Postum a more popular drink? <laughs> yeah, Postum is underrated. Whenever an idea would come out that was uh, too crazy for me, it would always fit George perfectly. George was really a catch-all for a lot of ideas. He was a guy who you could buy doing any number of extreme uh, problem-solving techniques. <laughs> that it, w it was always a good, an easy buy. And so Larry, who really had the problems and would conceive of these solutions to these problems that were always beyond civilized execution. But George, we could put it on him and you could get away with it. It's come to my attention that you and the cleaning woman have engaged in sexual intercourse on the desk in your office. Is that correct? Who said that? She did. Was that wrong? Should I not have done that? I tell you, I gotta plead ignorance on this thing because if anyone had said anything to me at all when I first started here that that sort of thing was frowned upon, because I've worked in a lot of offices, and <laughs> I tell you, people do that all the time. <laughs> George never felt guilty that he was trying to cheat someone, because he had already been cheated, as far as he was concerned. He was just getting a small amount back from the casino that had already totally emptied out his bank account. We all have a little bit of George Costanza in us, which um, we all relate to, and probably is why we find him unlikable because there are all things in ourselves we don't like. And it was only a year ago that my older son said, what is Seinfeld? I mean, can I see it? What is it? And we sat down and showed him about 10 episodes and he just went, oh, dad, <laughs> you're an <laughs> I mean, I can't believe this is what everyone is, is this is what George is? I went, that's George, my son. That is what, that's what's putting you through college, my friend. You know, the, the acting thing is, uh, frankly, coming a little hard. I love to go back to TV. That seems good, but I can't shake this George thing. Really? They all see me as, uh, as George. I mean, the thing about it is that you're not even close to George. I tell this to people all the time. You can't imagine what a great actor this guy is. Oh. He is nothing like that character. Thank you. Nothing. Thank you. I know. I, and, you know, I go in and I talk to them and, we, you know, I try to present differently, but they, uh, <clears throat> they see the idiot. They see the schmuck. So, I don't know. We'll, well what do you mean schmuck? I don't get that. What do you mean schmuck? The yachts, the idiot, the, 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 you know, you know, you know. No, I, I, frankly, I don't know. I mean, I don't know why you could say he's a schmuck and a yachts and an idiot. I don't see him that way at all. I just see him as funny. I mean, of course it was funny. But he was the he was the fall guy. He was the, the the jackass role. He was you know this is the guy that never got the girl and he finally gets well, so a girl what? and he kills so her uh, with the envelope and the, doesn't know what he wants. That's funny. And, and, That's not uh, schmucky. That's you know. funny. What what is more jerky or putsy than 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 going to a girl's house and stealing a a, a tape out of her answering I machine? I saw. I went to a girl's house and took a tape out of an answering machine. Larry, he's eating eclairs out of a garbage yeah, can. Yeah, so what? I ate an eclair out of a garbage and he's, can. He's so what? Masturbation contest for people. I was in a contest, that... and you know I was in that masturbation contest. All right, fine, fine. So you know, what? I'm a schmuck for being in a masturbation contest. Uh, it's not an incredibly noble experiment, was it? Well, I'm sorry that you hate the character so much. I don't much. hate the character. I'm a little tired of it. I mean, I'm an actor. I have a range of characters that I can play. Why am I relegated to this? The connection between Larry and George was that Larry always wanted to do these crazy things to get back at people or to solve this problem or why would someone say that and what could I do about that and even though he never did those things in life, his mind always ran uh, along those lines. But in George, we had the perfect little voodoo doll that we could just stick a pin in him and make him do it.
It was the best thing that ever happened to me. Good. I feel like my old self again. Totally inadequate, completely insecure, paranoid, neurotic. It's a pleasure. <laughs>